crash course meeting. Things are really starting to get exciting now. <laughs> uh, first thing we'll do is you should have there should be a sign-in sheet going around. So please just uh, have most everybody's information. There's a few folks here that, that I don't know that uh, we'll do a quick go around. Um, just your name and what your uh, affiliation is. Coordinator of the Ulster County Emerald Ash Board Task Force as of several months ago, and um, just trying to really make it uh, really get out the word here in Ulster County. As those of you that, that drove in uh, from faraway places, or um, you saw that there's, there's even along Route 28 now, you see uh, you see a lot of the, the woodpeckering. So people are really starting to call and take notice, and as our municipalities, which is, which is a good thing. So anyway, I'm Aaron, and um, and I'll so I'll say this is Megan. Uh, Megan Butts is an intern for the Department of the Environment, which is what I work for. And she's a, a geography student, a geography student, GIS. She's helping with some of the GIS, some of the maps that that you see or have seen um, for EAB for us, but. <laughs> so, she's sitting in to learn. I'm Jordan Volker. I'm the owner of Limber Tree Services. Eric has been to a bunch of these meetings. I'm Don Crawford. I coordinate the Master Gardener program here at uh, Cornell. Um, we have eight Master Gardeners spent the winter training, 20 new ones for that. They do a lot of outreach in the community with um, attending fairs and festivals and they do farmers markets and they do the fair. They, they're out in the public, so they're our outreach arm as well as running a hotline three days a week and we get a lot of calls from folks. So I also do community gardens here. My name is Marilyn Wyman. I work with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties in the Natural Resource and Environment Program area. I also work with Cornell in the Invasive Species Program. Uh, my principal audiences relate to really forests and forestry. I work a lot with foresters, loggers, and we've been doing a lot with, in particular, forest invasive pests um, with our master forest owner volunteers. My name is Rick Marstow. I also work with uh, CCE of Columbia and Green Counties. I've been the Master Gardener Coordinator for about 10 years, and uh, I've been working with Chris for the last year and a half. I'm also with Chris. <laughs> <laughs> What's Chris? <laughs> so Chris Catskill Regional Invasive Species Program, and I'm going to Part that partnership. partnership. <laughs> <laughs> and when it gets over there, these they're vacant. They're very excited. They're very good. They can talk. <laughs> I'm Sally Whistler, and I work at Cornell. I'm Mary Ann Rolson. I'm with the Sorgates um, Conservation Advisory Commission and uh, Lighthouse TV 23 Sorgates. I'm Jim Hansen, the Woodstock Environmental Commission. I'm representing the town of Woodstock here. Uh, and we can, uh, training our woodpeckers all winter long on how to find fresh organic food and they're doing very well. Just drive through and you'll see it. I'm Jeff Weger and I'm the Regional Forester for the Division of Lands and Forests with DEC in Region 3. We cover the seven county Laura Hudson uh, uh, Valley counties from Ulster, Dutchess, on down to Westchester over to Sullivan and Rockland. Uh, we do invasive species work. I'm a member of the CRISP Executive Committee. <laughs> we all wear many hats. Uh, we've been dealing with Emerald Ash more from the start. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Rosemary Brackett, uh, Sogadis Village Tree Commission. I'm Meredith Taylor, and I'm the invasive species biologist with the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. I'm Molly Marquand. I'm the new Chris coordinator. Sherman, who's my assistant. Sorry. <laughs> my name is Mark Whitmore. I'm with 
the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell, and I've been working on the World Ash Board um, around the state uh, since actually since before I got here. So, uh, Tom Stewart, New York State Department of Transportation. say that I got, I did get a call right before I left from Michael Barker, who was with uh, Red Cedar and Tree Services. Uh, he apologizes, he's trying to make it, can't, he's leaving for California or something. And, um, he was, you know, he was really genuine and he, he really, I could just tell he really actually wanted to be, <laughs> to be here. He's been up to all these other ones. So, anyway, so he had asked about, you know, who knows that. Marianne tapes it, and so try to make those available somehow. That, that, that video, so that he can watch, take minutes. I burn. Uh, so just in time. Severe. Yes, perfect. <laughs> I don't know. Pregnancy. <laughs> just, just in time. So who, who are you? And, yeah. Who am I? Introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Vern. I'm Ryan Vern. <laughs> Local tree guy, business called Helping Plants, like the ash trees. I'm more into saving them than cutting them down. All right. Good. Um, I also, the, uh, Eric from Limber Tree, we'll talk about the purple prison trap. Uh, I thought maybe he'll show up. Um, hoping he does. It sounded like he had something to show us. Um, Central Hudson, I thought was, I invited them. I was sure to invite them. Um, and I thought they were coming, maybe they will, and Ag and Market, so I don't know why, but I'm sure they're busy. So maybe they're, I guess what I'm trying to get at is hopefully there will be a few other folks that trickle in. Um, so we have a lot on the agenda today, um, and uh, you know, we have the room until 1. It'd be great if we could finish before then, um, but there's a lot. So um, I guess we'll get we'll get right into it. Um, any other questions or any other things that are not on the agenda that, that folks want to talk about? Um, well, the first thing was just to um, an update on current projects and initiatives, sort of to go around. Um, it's been three months, a little bit more since we met last time. Um, and the first thing that sort of was the, uh, one, of the bigger, one of the bigger pieces of news locally was the town of Woodstock's um, Emerald Ash Borer Preparedness Plan. That, um, that they, at the last meeting we got an update, it was actually the night of that meeting, the town meeting. Yes. Uh, right, I think, Jim? And, and, and so Audrey was going to sort of present it to the town and we know, I think most of us know that what happened was it was eventually adopted and there was a resolution and I'll let Jim take over. Um, yeah, Tony's presentation was, uh, it went, went very well. They really appreciated the information. She gave them a lot of information so they knew what was coming, knew what uh, the thing was, um, and indicated a willingness to do something with it, wanting time to look at it. Um, next thing that happened, the supervisor got back and said, really that document had too much information for a resolution, and he wanted the Environmental Commission uh, to do something with that. So the chairman of the commission and I pared it down and sent them something. Uh, is, that and still, then, is that still David Gross? Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, so we we got it down to uh, I think a little over a page, and then the town supervisor got it to a paragraph. Uh, but <laughs> we got it passed with no uh, no objections at all. Um, and basically, it's a very short resolution which was passed on Tuesday, January 16th, uh, which says be resolved. Uh, to accept the recommendation of the Woodstock Environmental uh, Commission to use a combination of strategies to mitigate the threat to public safety caused by the emerald ash borer's devastation of uh, native ash trees 
quote, to wit, removal of affected and dying ash trees in town ownership, treatment with insecticide of carefully selected ash trees whose continued existence is deemed uh, in high public interest, and the Environmental Commission has already paid for Vern to treat a large ash tree on the town property. It's a symbol of protecting trees. Uh, and preemptive removal of ash, tree, ash trees located in highly trafficked public places deemed to pose an immediate uh, or near future threat. So we did get a resolution with some things done. So we were happy for that. Oh, that's, that's great. I did, I did uh, we still haven't been able to think about doing a, a press release if, if Supervisor Wilbur was interested in that hasn't materialized yet, um, but it sounded like he, I did speak to him on the phone, and he's, yeah, he was very, was happy, I mean, sad because of the situation and the loss of ash trees there at the town hall or the town, and, um, but he was, but he, but he gets it, you can tell that he gets it, um, which is just, that's a huge, a huge start. And at the meeting where they accepted it, I, I was at that meeting just to make sure nothing went wrong, because it's government. Uh, and uh, I let them know afterwards that uh, congratulated him for being the first town in the state that has done something. So I said, again, Woodstock is out front. So I keep encouraging them to stay out front. Yay, <laughs> Jim. And I hope Tom's work with the state is one of the things that's going to help us push that. Because, you know, I have pointed that out. He's already come through and done 375. And as I understand, you have plans for 212 going out the other way. Yep. And it'll be easy for you to see some of the trees. Um, so I'm hoping that piece will, will start falling into place. And maybe with Thursday's meeting, we'll be able to make some more headway on that. Start coming up with hope implementation plans. I have another question for you. So the rubber hits the road when you get a budget item. You got any money to treat trees? We the Environmental Commission had a limited amount and we used it on that one tree. How much more money they're going to do for treating trees, I don't know. Uh, there are some trees that I on private property uh, and I think maybe Vern can talk to, talk to this, where some people have opted, right? Oh, there's a lot of private homeowner people that are willing to invest in saving their ash trees a lot. Right. The, or, so, so, again, select the really good specimens and accept the fact that you can't do, it, do them all. The, the thing about a lot of the woodstock trees that are on, on, on public property, they never were planted as street trees and stuff, so they aren't the beautiful ones. Those are on private property. They're mostly 10-inch uh, DBA and below we're talking about. So they're all mostly right, just right-of-way trees that have seeded in. Yeah, so it's hard to get money committed. Um, so speaking of wanting to talk 
about sort of leads into the training, the workshops, or outreach, or education? The um, the May, what did you say, May 4th? Yeah. Uh, let's start the May for Yeah, May, for for May 4th, work. we are, um, thanks to uh, Cornell, we were able to get these guys, if you've seen them or haven't seen them, the tagging for ash trees, people from Cornell, I'm sure, have seen them. Um, and I wanted to do this over the winter, but because this next phase is on town of property that isn't streets and the major trails are on the Como property, which is a large property where we have a bunch of walking trails. Um, and the Land Conservancy, Woodstock Land Conservancy, is over the easement, so we wanted to do something in conjunction with them. So timing got stretched out. They do a thing called First Saturdays. And the first Saturday in May were going to be something that I'm encouraging them to call uh, Watch Your Ash. <laughs> uh, just because it's Woodstock. Uh, and hopefully we will have some people there uh, to help with ash tree identification. And then we will get small groups who will, who will walk the trails in public areas, mark and count the trees so we can give the town an inventory of trees or no, ash trees, because they're, they will be coming back. They're not trees. On the property that uh, pose some liability, so the town has a better, better idea of what they're dealing with on that piece of property. And it also leaves this, that trail is heavily walked by people. There are a lot, there's lots of foot traffic. And so it's another informational piece, as well as the workshop. It's the ongoing uh, thing hanging on the tree. So that's Saturday, May 4th, starting at uh, 10 o'clock. Is that a Woodstock specific tag, or is that a generic tag? That's a generic track tag, um, which Cornell did. DEC's you can get through, yeah. yeah. So it's mostly recovery training and outreach. And yes. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they, they, they printed thousands of them. The Mount Arboretum uh, did them. Um, I went up there to their tag in Green County, and they they did them on their trees because they have a lot of people coming and looking at trees. You don't realize how many there are. Mm -hmm. the the stand up at the Mount Arboretum is really a lovely stand. White ash, naturally. Yeah, gorgeous. It's really nice. It's a, it, How many are there? There's a lot. <coughs> 180. Yeah, 100. In, in the one area right in the Arboretum that's right. right next to the main area. They're all, I don't know if they're, they're still tagged. They probably are. Do they have any money for the tree? Probably not. I haven't asked. There's, in terms of treatment, as the market goes, materials, there's more and more materials that are coming into bear. Some of them are coming off of. Uh, Priority or whatever that's called, or they're going to. I'm hoping the materials start becoming less expensive because right now they're really expensive. And, um, Are you talking about the product? The product. Amamectin benzoate. Yeah, amamectin benzoate triage is really expensive. Um, but there's other materials coming out, and I think that's going to become more of a generic material now because it's often the I'm throwing a blank on the term, but they have a certain amount of years that it's theirs, and then it becomes public. Public domain, so the copyright thing. <laughs> That's I'm pretty sure it's coming off, and so hopefully the material will become less expensive. There's also the material that you can spray right on the bark. It's that no you're on, which is effective, and that's becoming more available for one year. For it's only for one year versus two years or three years with the. It's less expensive than it might get It's a little less expensive and a lot easier to apply. So all these things come into play. In terms of how much time it takes you, how much it costs, somebody that's trying to make a living by doing it, I'm very willing to try to make less of a living for people that have less of a budget that want to save some asterisks. When, when I spoke to the people at Arborjet, they said they would be willing for, if a town was buying a large amount of it, to, to work on price. Right. That's all they would do. Right. Arborjet's very, very high end. Yeah. Cover their own. Yeah. There's other people. I like. There's another company that I work with that I like a lot more, but they sell our just. 
stuff. Um, Rainbow Tree, Scientific uh, Tree. Is okay. They're really good with. I think there are ways good with get, reality. I think there are ways uh, in the group buying. I think there are ways to get a deal from these guys. And you know, I just I don't know how to do it. But I, one of the things actually that the uh, Monroe County uh, Task Force did is they uh, the city of Rochester bought tons and tons, and so they just used the product to treat help treat other local towns. Uh, they contracted out their crews, so that was a way to get around the cost. Right. So I don't know what kind of deals you can get going, but I'm going to talk later on about a strategy that I think would work really well for areas where you have like 100 trees that you really like to treat, uh, but you, you want to do it the least expensive way. So we, I'll get into that later. All right. So we'll, uh, great. Thank you. Yep. Great. And, uh, I'm sure we'll hear more as we go on through. Um, Eric, you want to talk about the purple prism trap? <laughs> yeah, it didn't go well. It didn't go well. It was, it was, a, it was a pretty much a complete, not complete failure, but um, I, I have to resort to plan B now. Um, it seemed very well conceived. I guess. It, it, it was well conceived, and we had the skeleton built, but it was actually built in reverse. So it was in the fold up into a pyramid. It's now a big three panel piece. I have to redo the whole thing. Or if you want to keep that as a backdrop, we can do that too. But I also had printer problems. You can see it. My printer didn't. So plan B is to actually um, use purple fabric and uh, print the individual green panels on the on my printer and stick them to the purple fabric. So I, I had trouble printing these. Looks great. Yeah. Looks good. Yeah. 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 I have two panels done. I have skeleton in the car. I can go get it. Um, but uh, it's almost, it's almost there. Well, this is a huge. You know, as we get going into this, it's a, a huge undertaking. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it wasn't. You know, it's not going to be easy to pull off a six-foot purple prison trap. But, um, so close. I don't know. For folks that uh, have not been in the past discussions, this is just one of the panels of the trap. This thing is huge. This thing is huge. Right? It would be portable, collapsible, right. be able to go, you know, to, to take to fairs or festivals or put up in, uh, you know, whatever, a town hall for a week or something, you know, before the vote for the next preparedness month. No. But, yeah, you know, I think you'd be far more successful at attracting people than you would be. That's good. They don't work very well, but you need an inflatable ash for it. Right. Call it out. Uh, for, the, for the Woodstock event. You think out uh, Hillary Pan outreach, right? Good. Right? She's already said that. <laughs> True. Oh, no. Dressing for her personal costume. For, for the Woodstock event, uh, for the Woodstock event, the has given me a used actual purple trap. I'm just going to print out the small panels, stick them on the glue that's already there, so I have something to hang over our table at that meeting. Do we scrape it over? No, I got a lot of good bugs. So, anyway, it's, it's, it's tie back. I don't know if you want to. That is kind of passing around, but maybe take a break or something. I don't know. So, what? Are you frustrated at the point where you're just going to give up, or do you think we can... No, I'll go to plan B. I'll actually buy some purple material. Unless you folks want to go with this material. It looks great. Do you want to leave it out? What I realize, though, is actually scratches fairly easily in transport. So the purple is coming off one panel, which I do, again, I have in the car. So I can show folks who want to move it around if they want to go with this. It can be a little more resilient. Maybe you want to connect yeah. afterwards yeah. and we'll see what the best. All right. So, well, thank Sorry, you I didn't have a better report to that. Oh, we appreciate your effort. So it's, 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 it's been a long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, trainings and workshops. What events? I think of what. Well, the, we can hear this. The, anybody 
have any of the, I, put, I left the parasitoid, I'm jumping down a little bit, the parasitoid release in case anything from ag markets is here. They, they seem to report, again, last time, right, they reported on their success. And the, has anybody heard? Because I, I haven't. I haven't talked about it. Okay. Right now, we'll do it or, it now? Let me do it later. Okay. All right, let's do that later. Um, trainings and workshops, is there any, has anybody been to some or have some upcoming? donors on his property and did some follow-up, follow-up protocol, sent it to Mark, um, was confirmed, reported it to then DEC and Ag and Markets. Um, I think actually right after that, because we wanted to make sure we could release the information, um, and I believe when I'm looking at the, the coordination, I think the DEC came down the following week then and found many more <laughs> infestations. So, I just started to pull um, the task force that I had inherited the list from Audrey, sent it to some other key people. Um, we are going to do an on-site visit tomorrow. There's about 15 to 20 people um, that are going to meet there, including the person from the Mountaintop Arboretum. That was the second person I sent you, and you said you didn't think it is, but now I think it is at the mountaintop arboretum, because Joan had sent us, well, let's hope not. Um, so we're going to do that tomorrow, and then to, and then following that, we're going to go back to Catskill and try to revitalize our EAB task force with some information. Um, but I, I know we're going to be talking about the coordination with Green and Duchess, and, you know, I think as much as we can, collaboration is going to be really key. And I know for the CRISP prism, um, part of it is in the CRISP region, and that part of it is actually in the Capital District region, which is just trying to get itself coalesced into a functional group. So I think the more we can work together and share information, I mean, I'd actually like a copy of that resolution. And it's like, I'd say, hey, here's a good resolution. And I think these examples, we don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. And once a community takes the initiative, at least you have somebody, you have some someone to hold out there and say, look, let's, let's do this. Then. So, you know, we're, we're trying to be proactive. We're trying not to be, you know, scare people. But, you know, there are definitely, I think in Greene County, Chris helped, you know, or did coordinate many um, street tree inventories. That doesn't seem to be so much the issue as private landowners with large swath, uh, large clusters, large acres of, of pure ash, and that's, I think that's a bigger concern, or as, as great a concern. Uh -huh. the IMAP. Will those DEC observations be put into IMAP cases as well? That's a great question. Um, I would hope so. Yeah. I've been trying we to get need to talk that. about this. I, I think they really should get into IMAP, that way they become publicly accessible. Yeah. Uh, so we can actually know where they are and things like that. I've been too. trying to get I've been trying to get them to do it. Right now it's like everything just it just Well it's out of sharing. I mean the first time I met Mark, one he asked me, you know, to do something with some GPS coordinates. And people that know me, I don't do computer stuff well. <laughs> so the point is there's there's no secrets here. Uh, just getting a data set, if I can say that, a GPS data set to the right people to have somebody in a seat yeah. to, you know, you know, the bug is moving. It's I, our, I encourage everyone to use IMAP, right. IMAP when you get when you get a, a point in there. I think it's really easy for everybody to use and not depend on somebody up in Albany who has five and a half million things on his plate right, right. now, uh, Scotty, who does the mapping for a DEC. Um, but to use IMAP for, for all these reporting, I use it for HWA. I use I put all my we're trying to put all my data on of, from HWA <coughs> on there so that we have it in the future because my desk looks like heck right now, and it's just so easy just to have it on IMAP. As soon as the report gets on IMAPs, I immediately get a, an email saying, "Hey, we have a new one," 
and then if it looks reasonable and, and you know, there's pictures attached to it, I think that's, that really helps. So using IMAP is a really great tool and we should be using it for all uh, EAB reports. I'd like to make a recommendation, or I'd like to make a, a recommendation to make a recommendation for this communication protocol. Because I think unless collectively there's a statement that says this is what we need to do, everybody's going to, nobody's going to <coughs> take responsibility for that. And, and I really think it would be, it would be beneficial if we talk to our key partners and say this is really important. And, and if they have, if you have to send the data to us, then we can input it. Sure. You know, but that was the, that was the breakdown because I went and I looked at IMAP and I go, oh, no problem. This is just the second infestation. I mean, there's that little cluster in cement, but it seemed close enough to Ulster that Again, it wasn't an issue. And then I'm in another meeting on Wednesday, and there are all these other, and it just was a little disconcerting. It's like, okay. Understandable. Think, just to be clear, we have Forest Health people that have been working on this project with other partners for, for you know, since it was first found uh, in Saudis in 2010. And from the start, and Mark, please jump in. Uh, initial sightings had to be confirmed right. by Mark, is one of the people in New York State. There's one of the yeah, we have, okay, there was a big problem with using the public database, and that's that, number one, we wanted to be sure that any, Correct. because it was such a, regu a regulatory concern, right. we had to be certain that all reports were, were validated, and, and validated very quickly. Right. Um, I think now that regulatory concern is decreasing, Especially when it comes to, uh, I think, the need for homeowners, for, for everybody to know where this is so that you can think about what you need to do. Mm -hmm. I think the need has shifted from a regulatory need to a need for information just right. so people can think about it and use the information to make their plans. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, so I'm encouraging everybody to use it, yes, but at first it was, it was very important, and that's why. Whenever there's an EAB or an HWA, Hemocrily Adelgid report, it's like I automatically get an email right off the bat. And I think that's still really important that we look at that. Because if it comes from one of the uninfested counties, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, why county, who knows, but you know, it's like that's where we're going now. I'll talk more about that later. But if it's definitely, if it's outside the quarantine, it's a really big deal. And, uh, and I think, but I think it's really good to get everybody used to it. And right now, right here, I mean, if everybody can get used to using IMAP, you can get on there, you can see where all the reports are, and I think that makes a, a big difference in how to operate. Maryland brings up a very good point, Mark, in terms of reporting. We've got a 1-800 number that people can call and get yeah. our forest health test. Jeff, I'm sorry, but does anybody ever answer that damn phone? Doug Schmidt's supposed to, yeah. I'm sorry, there's a... There's a it doesn't work. Okay, well, I'm regional office. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I, was like, I hate to say that, but it has a reputation. But uh, Marilyn's point is valid. How do we get this up-to-date information on a map? Uh, we've got various different systems. Um, the information I shared last week that Marilyn mentions at the Chris Executive Team meeting was new to me, too. Um, so this is going to become more and more common as people see more and more trees. You know, I agree entirely. And um, I, I think if we can work with IMAP invasives, I can bring it up to our forest health people I've in the central about. office, and if other people can talk to them also, because my understanding is one person, like Wilkinson maybe, in yep. IMAP, and Scott McDonald makes maps. Yeah. So you're right. Yeah, but they get the two together. And they have, they have, I think, you know, they just need to, to know that there's a, a, a definite need for this mm -hmm. information to be available. Oh, definitely. I think Meg would love to have, in fact, there's somebody working at IMAPS that her job is to take database and, and dump it into IMAP. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's a, something that can be done. Why don't you talk to Scotty and, or Jerry, and I'll talk to Jerry, and finally, you know, maybe we'll get it done. I think it needs to be on IMAP. Outside that, I will stress that our response plan, the original maps, uh, we have tiers, you know, five to ten miles out, you know, that don't, don't risk maps. That don't be surprised if you find five miles or ten miles. I have stuff in my presentation. I'll go over that. Great. Okay. So, so I guess 
So, so we're, saying, we're suggesting that, that any workshops or trainings that we all do, like the one tomorrow, the one which I'll talk about on Thursday, should we be should we be recommending the use of IMAP for folks to upload, whether it be municipal highway folks or anything they're out. That's, and that's, what's, that's what's for, right? That's exactly what it's for, and I think this is a perfect opportunity to get people used to it because it's yeah. definitely need for EAB. Who knows what the next one will come? Unfortunately, it will be the one. And so, I, so the data you're, I just got this morning from Rob Cole, all the, the new infestation points that you're talking about, all the all the detection points, um, the uh, the shape file. Thank you. Uh, Good. So. So how would that get to us? That, that, that's what you're talking about. So can you just you upload the shape file to IMAP? I mean, I'll do that when I get back. But so there's someone at IMAP, Heidi Craylin, that does these bulk data uploads. So it would just be a matter of communicating with her, and she can probably right. upload it. A lot of Rob Cole's data is already in there, but I think they're probably the most recent chunks are what you see. Also, I thought maybe it would be worth mentioning in, in workshops and trainings. Uh, it's really, uh, I included an uh, IMAP training in a workshop in Western New York, and I found it a lot easier than I thought it would be to include basically 20 minutes. And, and there's a video online. <laughs> you could even yeah, sure. use the online. video. Right. In a, in a workshop situation, play the video or just go through the steps of submitting observations. And then what happens is you have to uh, get a sense of who is going to be using it. And then you just email their names and email addresses to Jennifer Dean at IMAP. And she's really prompt and efficient at getting signed in uh, for you so that if you even at the DPW training, for instance, we could probably get logins for whoever wants to use IMAP. Yeah, a lot of us have went through training. I, you know, I can't use it, but uh, my question back uh, is how are these sites confirmed on IMAP? If a private landowner sends one in from, you know, White Plains or whatever, is Mark is going to run around and check things out? I look at it. I look at pictures. Okay. And then if it looks, if it looks, you know, it eventually gets back if it's, to you. If it's in a location that is important, and I'm questioning it, we'll send you out to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll send the force out. <coughs> yeah. sure. Okay, so there is that. So yeah, that's okay. that's the way we operate with that. Okay, great. Well, I need this crisp views I have for other invasives. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, there, and I just want to mention that some of us that are an S computer <laughs> friendly. I'm, I'm with you. And I, yeah. Uh, it takes us a little longer to, but the basic putting an observation in, I think a, a child could tell oh, you. Yeah. So it's really simple. It's just to do assessments and things like that. It gets a little more complicated, but I think, you know, the older folks have to work a little harder. At it. You know, not to say that you're an older folk. But <laughs> 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 Great. Question for, for folks, for Arbor. Oh, no. <laughs> Jordan, Eric, I mean, is, that, is that something that, that you guys can do if you're yeah, out of hand? <coughs> yeah, you really know, it's similar to the highway. Is there an app for that? Yeah, there actually is. There is. What is it? Yeah. Well, I think it's going to be web-based, so, so you can just go on, if you have a smartphone or whatever. Yeah. yeah. It's not on the app store. And you guys do need to be trained. I think Crisp is going to be the first person to have the training on April 3rd in the 11 to 3. What's the lead All right. Molly, you're on. Vince, uh, <laughs> trainings and workshops. April 3rd. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, that's the first one. Um, so Jennifer is doing a series of these IMAP trainings, and that's they're kind of targeted towards Crisp partners, but anyone is welcome. So on April 3rd, um, we're having kind of an update meeting for the partners at 10, 10 to 11, and then from 11 to 3 will be the IMAP training done by Jennifer. Um, Where is that? Where is it on? Sorry, at the Catskill Center in Arkville, right on Main Street. Right local. Yeah. <laughs> and people need to register for that as well? Um, if you have questions, you can contact me. Yeah. 
mentioned it took 20 minutes, and I'm here four hours, so what's the difference? To learn how to get to that shorter time. To get to Artville? <laughs> the, 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 the full training, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, she does, she does I guess, different um, tiers of training. Right. So she does, does a one hour. Yeah, and then she, Yeah, and then she does, this is the advanced training, so you actually would, she gives the presentation, and then you go out and you practice it in the field kind of mm -hmm. thing. I mean, we would just stay local when we're not taking a trip anywhere. But. And in IBA, there's the levels of functioning. So the most basic is you go in and you submit an observation. But to be useful to more people, they have a survey tool. on these kinds of issues before, you know, um, I was mostly working in invasive plant species. I, um, my first reaction was, I guess as Marilyn was saying, that there's a real need to reach out to private landowners, you know, there seems to be so many great resources and such a great support network, but it doesn't seem like people are receiving this information, um, you know, to the degree that they need to be. So um, one of the things that we've been working on um, is a mass mailing to people within the tier three core area that you were discussing. Um, you know, people whose ash are likely infested and are gonna be dying in the next year or so. Um, people who need to take management actions now and you know, I, I, um, some recommendations, simple steps that they can take and you know, just a whole lot of resources that they can access. Um, so I brought a very rough draft, which I can show to people if they're interested after the meeting, because we would love to have feedback. Um, um, <clears throat> and we are also planning to have kind of an ash management series for our private landowners that we would be coordinating, um, hopefully, again, in this core area where the infestation is really bad. Um, hoping to have one at the Woodstock Town Hall possibly first or second weekend in April. Um, and then, you know, periodically throughout the season. Um, also... If, if you could uh, have someone join us on May 4th, it might be yeah, helpful too. Yeah, absolutely. I wrote that down. Because that's, that's yeah. you know, we're hoping to get enough publicity to get a lot of the public there and really start spreading the word yeah. more effectively. Yeah. And we also have a lot of those tree tags, those yellow tree tags. So for folks who are more local, if you need them, we can provide them. Um, and help, you know, if you need volunteers to do an event, we can help um, organize those volunteers. Well, if I could ask a question. Uh, I, I didn't get a chance to look at that brochure. I think it's a great idea. The ash management workshops, would that be geared to larger landowners, 15 acres, 15 acres? Yeah, I mean, that's something that we've discussed for this mailing. We did to everyone within the core area that owns more than an acre. Um, I mean, I think, I, I don't really know what to expect, again, being new to this, how many people will come if we reach out with this kind of event. Um, Chris Zimmerman, who's the chair of the Chris Executive Committee, has discussed making it larger owners, you know, 10 acre with lots plus. I mean, I tend to buy off more than I can chew, and I think that it would be great to have anyone. I mean, it is such, I live, you know, in this area, and there's really high density stands of ash. You know, you could have a couple acres and have a few ash trees on your property, as I do. So. We did a 5,000 postcard mailing a couple years ago, and 30 people. Really? Yeah, I wish.
wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. worry about getting overwhelmed. Right. Unfortunately. Broadcast it. Right. right. Yeah. I guess I, oh, I'm sorry. My point is, it's almost a different focus. Like your area has a lot, lot, a lot of larger landowners. There's a lot of smaller landowners here. Right. I'm wondering if the people in that core area that are looking out their windows and seeing woodpecker trees and cut down trees already. Because there's a lot of good stuff out from Pete Smallage about you know uh, helping large right. make these decisions. Right. Well, as I said, you know we're hoping to have this as a series because I think you know reading that kind of familiarity makes people more interested. You know, um, so there's no reason why we couldn't tailor different ones to slightly different audiences. Has there been a lot of media coverage around all the trees that are being removed right now and all of that? I mean, is, it, is that on the local? Channels. Yeah. Yeah. Did anybody see YNN last night? No. I, I just happened to, whenever I turn, it's default to channel 706 or whatever, channel, whatever, YNN. And I, I'm, I turned it on, and this is at like 10 o'clock last night. And sure enough, there it is, Emerald Ashbore with someone from ESF talking about the quarantine. And, you know, not nothing specific to. Ulster County, even though it's the, out of Kingston here, the, but it was all just, you know, talking about the quarantine and, and how the, the concerns are moving the wood from an infested area to an uninfested, previously unknown infested area, but within the quarantine, you know, and so it was just, it's funny that, because, right, that's, I mean, it's important, but I think it, they could have done a heck of a lot better job if they made it a lot more local or something that people are really going to understand when they look, when they look out the window. We had a, we had a from the start. The initial, it seems like people are, oh, this is new, this is new, this is a story. Yeah. But the story is going to become like in the Midwest now, where, or even all the pictures, Massachusetts, all where they're coming. having trouble providing essential government yeah. services like garbage pickup because they cut so many trees. That's going to be the next story. Uh, it has been relatively quiet. Everybody's done a great job with outreach from Chris. But we, we can't discount the small things either because Woodstock, with our informational things, the beginning ones were relatively small. But this winter, with the, with the help of the woodpeckers waving flags, uh, a lot of people have come to me and said, wow, that ash borer really is as bad as you guys predicted it was going to be. You know, so the information was out there. We start small, but it got out there. And then somebody says, what's happening to my ash tree? And somebody else says, that might be that animal enemy. You know, and so uh, even the pebble in the water makes waves go out. I, I took it more and more and more. Every, every few weeks I go out and knock on doors, and I've had more people say, oh, that's animal ash borer, recently in the past few months than ever before. They said, the DEC's been here. They've heard about it somehow. So it's out there. People know. But they don't know what to do. They say, oh, there's nothing wrong with my tree. I'm not treating it. Right. Well, it's too late once you see the sun. So, like I said, the pebble in the water. It's there. It's happening. But what's, what's the next step? What do they do? Because they know about it. So you know, this, this, is, this happens everywhere. It's, it's like a well-known thing that you, know, you get to a certain point of the death curve. And, you know, it's like 8% like is, is what they figure in the Midwest, where all of a sudden everybody in the area has an aha moment. And there's political traction to the issue. <laughs> so we're probably getting there right we're now. There. This, I think this, this summer is going to be the real thing that's going to get people going. And, you know, but I agree, you know, statewide, I, I look at other infestation areas of like Buffalo or Rochester, and it just, you know, there was the initial flurry of activity with its first detection, and that's just, it's gone off the map because we aren't at 8% yet. So it will show up. We will get more traction. And then it'll be more like budget for town of blah, 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 busted. And, uh, and that's what we see in the Midwest right now. It's like, how are we going to deal with it? I'll stop talking. I'll do more of that later. Mm -hmm. well, any uh, other events? From, we're kind of we're just, we're blending two and three, which is which is great. Um, so we'll, we'll just keep this going. Right, anything else? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have, you know, dates on any of these, but I'll keep other ideas and things that I'm working on if people want to partner. Um, we will, in some capacity,
hopefully um, be involved, hopefully with Ag and Markets work, um, you know, with WASP releases. Don't know how yet, but at the very least, you know, Teresa is here. She has a great background in entomology, and she um, will hopefully be doing some, you know, outreach concerning biological control for EAB to raise awareness in that department throughout the summer. Um, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know there's also a It's Great Lakes Restoration Initiative um, project going on to collect ash seed. Um, and I also have some um, some close ties to the Mid-Atlantic Regional Seed Bank and Greenbelt Native Plant Center, and they're also doing a lot of um, ramping up ash seed collection in the area. So we're hoping to do some seed collection workshops for, you know, nurseries or stream programs from whomever around here that collects local seed or has the permits to collect local seed. Um, and also some monitoring visits to these isolated ash groves that um, the Olive Natural Heritage Society right, did a project on a couple of years ago to kind of um, just, you know, I guess a little morsel of hope, but also to do some uh, some ground truthing for the Forest Service flyover data um, that was done a couple years ago looking at defoliation in the Catskills and to make sure that that de defoliation isn't a result of the EAB. So you're working with Ryan on that? Yes. Are you going to collect seed in those uh, special stands of uh, ash? I guess if we could get permits, permits to do that.
is uh, just if you had any uh, updates for Village of Socrates. No, workshops really. planned. Um, no, we've taken down um, our ash trees. We did the at the beach and along on 9W. Now there are five more, it seems, um, in the park. And they're being evaluated. And we're going to see. I'd like to try to treat them, but I don't know if we can. So I actually sent an email to. to I returned that. But I oh, you did? Yeah. OK. I, I did respond to your email. Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a look. Yeah. Recently? Three days ago. OK. I'll take, I'll take a better look. Yeah. So I would like. I said I'd be glad to come and do, uh, evaluate those trees. OK. Okay, that would be that would any time any time you're available, that would be great. Okay, that's perfect. Good. Um, yeah. So and then right, is, and the so village of Sargis hasn't is it now a um, because you've dealt with it previously? Is it is it a is it a budget? Is it, is it a future budget? Is it always going to be in the budget something? With ash well, treatment or um, that's hard to say. Yeah. You know. Um, I would like that to be the case, and I'm working on that. Uh, we didn't have a lot of ash in the village. Uh, there are a lot more in the town. And unfortunately, the town and the village are very separate. So um, I'm going to speak with the supervisor. I'll go to the town and see exactly where where they stand and what they're thinking, what they're doing. Do you um, have a counterpart in the town? No. No, there isn't. Right, well, you know, so, oh, I don't mean to interrupt. No, no. That Paul uh, Economos has been on this task force as a uh, member of the, uh, the task force series, the town of uh, Saugerties. Oh, really? He usually yeah. comes to these meetings, mm -hmm. so.
DOT been up to going to be up to? Oh, we got this year's tree funding again for approval. Uh, last week we cleared uh, 213 from five walls. That was 209 of um, uh, 62 trees. Right. That's for a little bit right now. Uh, last year we did finish the two thirteen uh details in the South Park Kingston. Uh, we also did three seventy five to twelve last year. We've been working out from the core area. Yeah. It's all nine done, it's done, but it's done so I mean there's other ones in there we're identifying now that the marks we yeah. uh, we'll try to follow up, probably have to go back again for the second phase, but That's my question, what your disposition is, your whole tree checking and the stuff for your checkers for you? Uh, we're disposing them on site within the zone. Yeah. All right. yeah. It's either that property owner right there for fire or something. Okay. Different standards, different 
age of the tree. It's the age of the tree. Age of the tree. Actually, that brown color oxidizes off pretty quickly, mm -hmm. and, and it changes you know, actually within a month or so. So you can tell the really fresh ones I as see. opposed to those that are just a few weeks old. Yeah, a few months. Yeah. Yeah. months or so. Another interesting thing, just uh, now there's blonde in trees everywhere, but the woodpeckers are blonding off that outer bark that really isn't that critical in the immediate life cycle of the tree. I'm anxious just to watch for interest in how much of these heavily blonded trees that still have really viable good buds up there, how long they stay looking alive in terms of the canopy. I think it's going to be more than, I don't think they're just going to be dead out. Right? No, no, they're going to leaf out. They're going to leaf out. Like by right. June, they're gone. They certainly leaf yeah. out. You know, one, of the, one of the things is that, especially in white ash, you know, they have the smooth bark at the top of the tree, yeah. and that it, the EAB won't lay its eggs in the smooth bark area. It's only where there's bark fissures. So you know, at the top of the tree, you'll still have a lot of green foam that's there that, that can produce the metabolites to get those leaves coming out. And so the, the, all the foam will be eaten on the lower bowl, but it will still be putting leaves out. Right. Why are you killing my tree? Yeah, well, all the, yeah. <laughs> you see that all the time. <laughs> my tree looks healthy. <laughs> it's a human condition. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that also begs the question, you know, why don't we have, excuse me, billboards on 
through 12 and 28 facing westbound traffic saying do not be carting ash in this direction. There's been some fact, there's one down. I've heard, you know, radio ads and some TV yeah. spots, I think, but um, I don't know, Bill, not, not a couple years ago, Billboard, maybe? We, no, we looked into Billboard's with the marketing firm that did the Asian platform field, oh. the public outreach campaign, and they suggested that it wasn't worth the investment. They were a little pricier, so we went with the radio PSAs instead. Yeah. Well, I don't know, these certainly better than nothing, right? Can we get yeah. like Yeah, we can modify that. I have I have the chance to of course even a spot for well, a sticker, but that would wash off. Yeah, yeah, if you want you, some of those in the meantime again, we have a lot. Yeah. Actually uh, our, that spot that is left open is for so that you can put one of those contact. mailing labels. You can print out your own mailing labels and put contact information on there. You could use that and you could print out on the mailing labels and yeah, don't move this fire away. But I don't know how many people would get to that fine point, have that fine print at the bottom of the room. Right. Yeah. You want it to be in the whole you know, I'm thinking, you know, when you do there, those, you we've done signs for events where you just have, a, uh, like, a, 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 it's like a hanger, a heavy gauge wire, and you just push it in the ground. Because so I'm thinking if, you, if there's a pile of material, how are you going to put it around, you know, couple of branches and what if somebody just you know if you had something you could just stick in the ground that says you know don't move this or something you know, like one of those long signs yeah yeah right. when you, you know, <laughs> on the road or if you're having an event or something recycle yeah might be a bit more uh, it's not a bad idea. Uh, accommodating to what we need to do you can make it a little bit bigger I'm just concerned that size is going to be, right. you know, and these all are going to require uh, PRs, radio spots, you know, it's, it's, you don't just stick a sign out there, you say we have it, and if you see these these signs, please don't take the wood, please don't take the wood, please don't, and it's against the law, and please don't take the wood. <laughs> so Tom, what, I mean, so the DOT, you guys contract that out to a, to a Splunder or something? Or? Well, we cut a lot of trees ourselves, and plus we have some tree money that we bigger contracting transport anything from Stone Ridge to soil because or soil because to the stock. We're not doing any of that. Right. Um, the contractor doesn't even want to do that. It's all about money for him. Sure. He wants to dispose of it as close as possible. Um, so we're trying to find disposal sites right on site with the property owners that are there. Would the DOT, so say the contractor goes through and does what, what they do, would the DOT then be able to put up to Just take a nail some. and pound one of those yellow Well, nothing's being left, left when they're done cutting. Because we're not leaving anything on the road. But the um, big chunks. That we're picking that up right then and there. As they're cutting it, we're following along with a log truck, a apprentice truck, and picking the logs up immediately. Oh, right. There's no, like, when the contractor comes to come back the next day and get the logs or a week later. He cuts a tree. It's, what he, when he walks away, it's a stump, a pile of wood chips. So there is no blue. Oh, so so and to take away. Certainly, with, well, for the county, which is not going to have that, that resource, uh, the town, certainly. So, you know, anything right, I think, probably chip up to 12 inches or so. Anything greater than that is going to stay there. Pretty much guarantee that. And then my crews, uh, we just got a bigger chipper. We just got an 18 inch chipper. So we're going to be chipping larger material now. Yeah. Right, so. if, if I could just add to Tom's defense, he's in the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a value you would think that the people that are picking up on the road on the wood side are real local, they're going to burn it real quick, and you're going to get some kill of the bug. So even though it is illegal to move any life stage in New York, we know 
So it sounds like there's a lot of coordination, maybe, that, yeah. that certainly the county, the state, you know, towns, to try to see if there's a way to do the right thing with this, um, with this material that is you know, coming away. So you see on roadsides very soon, Jim. I have another question for Mark. Um, what's, it, what's the most recent thinking on the percentage of the You know, I haven't done extensive sampling, but my sampling shows that it's probably around 50%, maybe a little bit more. That's so when I see a tree that's right. totally blonded, right. they'll probably get 50%. So that agrees with yeah. the info I have. Oh, it does. Okay, good. Yeah. good. The amount of work that's a little bit put out of phases. There's got to be some high energy return in those larvae for it to work. I haven't tried it myself. Yeah. <laughs> here and there, but my feeders are just still full. Jeff and Molly and myself will be hopefully Tom here available. 
great, and awesome, good. Um, will be available to talk to and present some information on um, what, what do you do um, and how you know, what's needed, what, what can you do. Um, I'm happy to report that we have, I got two more this morning, so there are now 21 people registered from seven municipalities, and that doesn't count anyone from Ulster County yet. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, you know, the town of Hurley sending eight guys um, because they just said, you know, I want everybody, every, we all chip in and do this, and so they want everybody to hear it, which is great. Um, there is, yeah, Village of Saugerties, there's two, uh, including the buildings and grounds supervisor. You know. So, it should be great. Um, really looking forward to it. Uh, <coughs> So that's that, and hopefully we can work some of the kinks out and maybe make it to, uh, you know, might be another need for it here in a few months. We'll see what, we'll see what happens. But um, clearly there's an interest there. Um, as, as part of that, what in terms of from the county's perspective and all the roads that the county roads, like the Sauk Hills and the road that we've, we've talked about quite a bit, um, um, I took a stab at sort of a, um, an action plan. I guess you would call it. It's kind of like the preparedness plan. But I have copies up here. Some of you have seen it and commented on it, which are really um, were terrific. You know, a lot of great feedback. But it's essentially making you know, the case that, that there should be some proactivity here um, in addressing this. And so um, I have copies. I'll pass them around. I'm not going to go through. We'll go, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, but it's, I still consider it draft at this point. Um, we'll go through it at the, uh, I'll go through it more at the workshop on Thursday. Um, but it's meant for DPWs to sort of triage what, you know, what's out there and how can we try to work towards um, reducing, the, reducing the risks and, you know, not breaking budgets. Uh, so I'll pass these around, take one if you want. Um, the, the, the bigger ones are color, um, so, but it's, I printed out on the wrong paper by accident, but they're color, so even though I have to deal with a larger paper, it's a color. These are just black and white, so like the map on the back won't, won't come out um, too well. But, um, yeah, I don't know, I, I think we want, I want to keep moving. Um, if there's questions on that, um, there's, but it, we use the tier one, tier two, tier three to sort of, um, to triage what, what the different levels were. Um, and then talk about how to dispose uh, some of the options there, cut and leave place, or chip and leave place, or transport to um, the, the, the OCRA, the Ulster County Resource Recovery Agency, has this large horizontal grinder, which can do the job, except getting the material there. Obviously, there's a giving time costs on that. There's also the transportation issue um, that comes into play. You can bring it, but then Another cost of moving this thing, which you need a tractor for, like a, like a tractor trailer kind of thing. Um, and the, it's $50 a ton, I believe, to, to chip if a municipality wants to. So I'd like to keep revisiting that and see if maybe there will be a way Because that's once, once the county uh, heard that cost, they said, yeah, no thanks, thanks but no thanks. So um, maybe there's a way that. I don't know, I'm all ears for <laughs> ideas of how to make that a lot more um, accessible, uh, feasible. Um, on the back, the last page of that, I'll just mention it. And actually, I have a color maps this time. This is a, this is a, an example um, of what you mentioned the Forest Service data. So there's data that the data set that I got. Um, for that ash distribution, it sort of played with the, the, the data a little bit. Um, and so the green areas, because it, it was taken at, I forget what the resolution was, but once you zoomed in, it looked all uh, pixely. And, and it, from what I can tell, it looks pretty good. It's, you know, it's based upon soil type and topography, and so it's not really, those aren't the true ash stands of ash, but they're, they're close. And from what I can tell in the field, especially on my road, um, where there are a number of ashes, it indicates that there was a high probability of ash. So what's going around there are the county roads in the sort of
sort of the core area of the infestation and sort of the, the pitch is to start looking at those roads and do an inventory along there and so we can so then the county highway crew can then prioritize where you want to go. And also on that map are the old is the old detection data set from Rob Cole. Um, so those are the positive ID points, the pink dots on there. Um, and so that's just true on there just more, more or less for fun. But um, you know we all know it's all true there and all the roads need to really be looked at. Um, but it shows you that you know here in this part of Ulster County you have you have some ash. It's not I wouldn't say it's it's high uh, density or a lot of it, but but you know, when you see it, you think you know along the Zena Road there's a lot of it. When you look at all the, the woodpecker, and, um, but then there's areas like in the Catskill Forest Preserve there are a lot there there's ash, but they're a lot bigger because they're older trees, and so they're bigger ash. So like the the, the, uh, the basal area of the ash are, are bigger here. They're smaller ash, but there's a number certainly in the southern part of the county where the soils are uh, a, lot, uh, a lot wetter. There's a higher probability of, of ash. But again, this was a map that Megan actually did a lot of work on helping to get with, with some of this information to get, to sort of make the case that, you know, this is an issue that, you know, Town, the, the county highway department is going to want to address and look at. Um, so the data, it's more mostly for visual purposes. I wouldn't go out and say, oh, you know, I know right on this stretch on mile, whatever, 2.3 of Zena Road, there's um, this map, the screen dot says that there's ash there, but just to show, um, make a visual, because visuals are very powerful. Yeah, if I could add here, you did a great job with this, so I know you've been working seriously. Uh, two points on this map, and I'll probably make it when I show the other map. That data set on ash distribution from the Forest Service probably does not reflect well the density of ash along the roadways. This was probably data that was collected more in the forest. You get closer to the road, foresters want to be in the forest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is, it, is, this point? is this FIA data? Right. Oh, okay. But I, I'm thinking, Mark, yeah, you tell me, because Everybody, Aaron got the data, which is great. <laughs> we don't have the Forest Service yeah, here, we'll ask him. It's the interpolation. Yeah, yeah, my point is, don't take, yeah. like you just said. Yeah, you can't. I live just on 213 Zena Road, I don't have any dot. ash because I don't have a green dot. Yeah. Same can be said about the confirmed red dots. Um, that is not, obviously there's ash trees with in right. that area right. that are infested. So those two points are very that's really good because I have people who just, they'll look at a map of Greene County and they'll see some bands here and there and they go, well, you know, it really isn't an issue. And I'm, I, I, I'm thinking, well, this is not accurate reflection of what I'm driving through. So I'm thinking this is based I really, on permanent I appreciate plots that. all throughout the state. Okay. There's 10,000 permanent plots that have been sampled right. since the 30s, okay. 20s or 30s, and it doesn't really reflect well the density of ash along road rays, power lines, infrastructure. Stuff like that. So yeah. underplays. The scale is way too fine. Yeah, for the data. Sure. It's yeah, like yeah. Going way out on the end of the board. Yeah. 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 Balancing. Yeah. Like I said, it's really for just for a visual. Like, look. Oh, here's the map of the county. You can right. see there's a lot of bigger ash up here. You know, there's less. Right. Um, but there's, you know, up here where we're talking about, it looks like there's not a heck of a lot of ash. But right. you know, driving the road, right. there's, there's a lot of ash. Um, and down here in the southern part, yeah, there's. A lot more down there. So that's kind of the, again, this was really for, to give sort of that, the highway department mentality, just sort of a, a no, all right, let's, this is what, you know, this is what, this is the data that's out there, and you now use it, use it, right? Yeah, it's important to, for them to try to identify ash trees, even if they're not affected, because as we saw right. in v Zena, uh, this thing in terms of being able to identify it is an explosion factor. Two years ago when uh, Mike Callan and I were going around Xena, we were hard pressed to find stands that had any infestation. Not true now, <laughs> because areas that we couldn't find anything, turns out they were riddled. But the first infestation with a 10 inch DBA tree tends to be much higher. You can't see it. You can't even see the initial woodpeckering. But once
what you get the second year where those 100 bugs hatch and 80 of them decide to be in that tree, bam, you know, it's totally infested all along the road that these trees you see that were just... I'll talk more about that. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, if you have comments on, on this, um, that's great. I, I won't share these, but these are just, you know, zoomed way in. Um, further up each mile segment maybe must be helpful this mile by mile segments of county roads where the tent is then to train the highway crews to go out and just sort of count once we come out identify ash <coughs> count the number of ash per mile um, and then so then they can at least have a have that plan and come up with an idea of what what is out there. Because I don't I don't think I'm going to be, you know, I'm not going to Experience has been probably going to be successful making the case like what what DOT has been able to do. And it's really going to be. Um, I'm going to have to come up with it. Give them a good give them a good plan. Um, well, we're going to have to play catch up now too. Yeah, and that's. And we so have, we're fortunate that we jumped on right away. We just married, and we've been staying with the spread, clearing. say, uh, ask if anybody has been up to Phoenicia and looked at 214, and there's a lot of blonding and woodpeckering going on on that road. 214? Goes right past the Phoenicia firehouse. Oh, I know that there's only, right, right along the stream there, they're, they're, they're big ash. Yeah. Um, there's only a few of them right there, but yeah, it's, I didn't, I didn't notice any, any blonding on those. I, I drive there pretty regularly. Yeah. But. I haven't been up past the school, but anyway, I'll take a look. Yep. Taking a look, because based upon Jeff's maps here, we're getting close. <laughs> okay, I just want to point out a couple things. Uh, I thought we were still doing like uh, oh, outreach events and stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, you can do no, that too. Ready. Uh, you can do that too. No, it's okay. I just. On, uh, I just want to say these task force meetings are fantastic. Greens County has been working on a task force. Ulster, also Duchess. Duchess, uh, Stephanie uh, Raiden uh, had planned a Duchess County EAD task force meeting last week that was canceled. That's going to be on the 21st. So I just want to give a shout out to these task force. They're very helpful to a lot of people. Uh, there's municipal people here. I think it's great that share new information like I'm going to share with you. Some of you have already seen this map. Uh, this is data that we had collected over the course of maybe a month this winter. Our forest health people have gone out uh, ahead of where we thought the bug was basically and found evidence. Uh, Marilyn uh, and I have discussed uh, up 23A from Catskill up to Haynes uh, Falls, uh, up Platte Clove a little bit, and out 28 towards Phoenicia. So this map is basically the risk map for the Mid-Hudson infestation. This is based on our response plan that's on, online. This is an updated map that we discussed earlier on uh, with Mark. How do we get these points? out to the public. So, um, but also we found evidence of the bug farther down the Hudson, east the Hudson in uh, Hyde Park, um, Van the Vanderbilt State National Park Service, that's uh, pretty much right across from us. Opus. The major point is, and people have heard me say this before, everybody wants to know where the bug is to prepare. So, 
based on, please realize this is a, a, our best estimate of where the bug is now. It certainly could be out in Oneonta. It could be down in New York City. Nobody's found it yet. Keep that in mind. I thought there were two trees in Central Park that they found. Emerald Ash Borer? That no. would be yeah. news to me. No? That would be news to me, too. We would know. Hey, I'll, be, I I heard. hey I'll be in the city for a lot of years, Mary. Uh, what's, the, what's the bandwidth? Is it five oh, miles? That, I'm, I'm going to get to that. That's uh, a good point. So a risk map, basically, uh, if you're close to this general area, a lot of work has been put into actually finding the bug over the years. Uh, if you're in the, uh, the red band, that is a severe risk. I'll back up. The core area is where we know the insect is. All right, so you can assume... For, for Maryland's case, from Haynes Falls down to Catskill, I know they ran out on 23A, a visual survey. The woodpeckering was highly noticeable. I believe they found exit holes um, at least out in uh, Haynes Falls, it could be. So the bug has been there a couple of years. All right. So the assumption for planning, we quickly need to segue into a response now. Okay, everybody wants to know where the bug is. So the bands, if you're in this black area, if you have ash trees in your yard or your 50-acre woodlot, uh, a municipality, Saugerties, Woodstock, whatever, you know, there's a good chance if you have an ash tree, it's going to be infested, if not now, real soon. So we got to think about doing something real quick. I would say there's 99% chance. There you go, Mark. Uh, the red out, that's a, a buffer, I believe, of five miles. That's, that's a severe risk that your ash trees could be infested. There's a good chance. Down to 80%. Down to 80%. There you go. You get into the uh, gold area, it's an elevated risk. There's a significant what percentage, Mark? Oh, I'm just guessing. <laughs> Chance the bug will be there. Okay, the thing with this map is, okay, the black line is drawn basically connecting the dots along the perimeter of where it's been detected, okay? Each one of those dots where it's been detected, it's been in one of those trees for probably at least two or three years, probably more, which means that it's very likely to be well beyond that point. It's beyond the black. There's no question about it. You know, how much of the red is infested is another question. But we don't really know because it takes a while to really see when it comes up. I mean, this, this is the stealth insect. There's no question about it. So is it in the yellow? Yes, it is. Is it in the red? Definitely. Um, and the black? There's no question about it. And you can come up and look at this map later. That's what I wanted to present. Uh, that's newer information that a lot of work goes into this. The discussion is very valid at the beginning of uh, really IMAP. Cool. This is going to play into what I have to talk about as well. Really Your insecticide uh, stuff, right? And I have okay. a question, which I think you answered via email yesterday. But do you, for the, just pick the further, furthest westernmost detections here on Long 28, you know, okay. the Emerson, that's the yes. area we're talking about. Those, do you know if they were woodpecks or if it was a tree that was cut down and had gallant, you know, what, any? Uh, I was not out there with the crew. I know Jerry Carlson it was out there. It was woodpecks. Okay, there you go. Yeah. I don't think they cut down a lot of trees. Once you get really good at noticing subtle signs of where the bug is, you, you know, you want to move quick. So visuals are very good. And, and you, you know, if it's at a reachable level, you take it off and look for the shape of the that's, that's all we use now. Yeah. And that's a couple of years. That means the bug's been there for two to three years. Yeah. Oh. Long for your bug. Yeah. Any questions about that? Because I know you have clients that have been looking at their ash trees for years. What am I going to do? Do I need to do anything? You know, I hope what we need to get to in part of the preparedness is a discussion that we had earlier uh, with Rosemary from Saugerties. When your options are very limited, there's three things you can do. You can watch the tree die, cut it down, or you can treat it. So we need to keep this very, very, very simple. Question that is coming to us a lot now that I hope Mark will touch on. 
when would be an appropriate time to treat them? And with that said, if there's no other questions, thank you very much for your... Yeah. Yeah, this idea of preparedness, I think we're beyond preparing. You know, I think we really need to shift into a response. And I know early on, <coughs> this is just part of this response conversation we need to have, but we were talking about, I mean, ash is a valuable firewood in rural communities where people do use firewood. We had a, I had a brief conversation with our forester this morning, and when you compare the value, even if you could strip, even if it's a great ash tree, you know, the value is like $300 per thousand board feet. It's a shame. Ash is beautiful, too. No, right. But the value is probably higher for firewood when you think about, you know, the amount you could get for a full quart of firewood. So I hope as we continue these conversations, we're not just talking about how do we, you know, we obviously want to control the spread, but I think we have a resource and potentially a community service that can be provided uh, if we, we talked about staging areas. I mean, we had some thoughtful conversations about how this resource can be used appropriately. So I just want to throw that out there. I don't think in our case we're necessarily preparing. I think right now we need to start thinking about responding. And that's why I'm glad you had that action plan. Well, no, I mean, we're going for EAB preparedness, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I'm talking a lot about communities, Marilyn, that even in the core area, uh, the great work that Chris has done with Ash Tree Inventories, they might be sitting there now with their, their report, you know. Mm. So a lot of those communities have not even done that yet. They don't have any idea. So I totally agree. The response needs to be happening now. I'm speaking more of... Uh, services we can offer communities and I want to add that we do now have a person, a DEC forester, committed to helping communities in Region 3. We shift things around. We are fortunate enough to hire a forester <coughs> last year. So George Propus could not be at this meeting with me. He's got jury duty all week. Uh, He's not a new hire. He's, he's <laughs> reassigned, right? Thank you. George has been reassigned as our urban forester for the region. I'm very excited that we now have somebody that can come out to communities. So, so I get that right from that. So he is a dedicated, he's our urban forester for the whole region. Nobody in any other regions right now? No other designated in other regions? Well, there's other people in AIDS. Uh, Omar Green has been promoted. But it's not a dedicated urban forestry position like okay. we have. Okay. Region 4 doesn't have it.
I still am amazed that we have a bug like this that we're dealing with. And as I said before, uh, many times, I don't think this is the last one we're going to get. Um, so I'm going to go through this. It's, I have a lot, of, a lot more slides than necessary. I'm going to sort of go on some of the updates here. Um, so there it is. Yes. This, by the way, it's TV. You can really see how beautiful this damn wow. bug is. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah, too bad you guys are squishing. So anyway, what I want to touch on today um, are some strategies that are being developed uh, in, in the Midwest that I think are, are something that we really need to pay attention to here. Um, there is hope. And basically what it does, you know, most people, we exploit the uh, killing the larvae by injecting a uh, chemical into the phloem tissue. We're getting it into the phloem tissue. And so we kill the larvae. But what I want to think, what I want you to think about also is the potential for killing the adult, which feeds on the leaves. This, those are the two, this are the two vulnerable stages because they feed on something. Uh, the leaves actually could be a really important part uh, of the life cycle that we can exploit. Um, another thing, you know, just to remind everybody, this is where it lives, and this is important uh, when you think about the use of the parasitoids that I'll talk about. Um, this is a very thick bark part of the tree. Some of the peep, some of the prepupa go up into the bark, which is interesting. You know why they go into the bark as opposed to in the wood? I don't really know. It's a, it's, uh, but the ones that are out here are much more apparent to uh, the woodpeckers, as are the larvae, and it's harder to get into the prepupa and the pupa down in the wood here. Um, there is a look-alike insect. This is it, the red-headed ash borer. It looks like a horseshoe nail. This is the head. The head is fat, uh, and then it tapers down, whereas the emerald ash borer, the head is tiny, and then it has the nested bells at the back. Um, this is distribution. One thing I'd like to get across is basically, you know, even though you see these bit maps filled with dots and everything, you see this huge quarantine area. We're actually at the very beginning of this infestation in the United States, and definitely in New York State. Very little of New York State is actually infested right now. You guys are in the middle of it right now, but everyone else is not. And you know, just to look at the numbers, basically, you know, within the quarantine area, as we know very well, very soon half of New York State is going to be quarantined. Yet, what percent is infested? probably less than 1% of our forests, or maybe 2% of our forests are invested. So you look at this big quarantine area and you go, oh my god, what's going on? But when it comes down to it, that whole quarantine area in 2011, where we actually have the data from, represented uh, only 18% of the area occupied by ash. And then if you think about the actual counties that are in quarantine, that represents only 9% of the total area. But then what percentage of Ulster County is infested, right? You know, 12 municipalities. 12 municipalities, maybe half of Ulster yeah. County, maybe. And you go to oh, Monroe County, it's maybe 10% that's infested. So it, it's like this number of 9% of the total area uh, is infested, it's in the counties in quarantine. You know, it's probably much closer to maybe 4% or 3% of the total distribution of ash in the United States that is currently infested. What does that say? Now is not the time to put our head in the sand. Now is the time to pay attention Look at those aspects that we can exploit and work on them hard, because now is when we have a chance. Once, once, once it's uh, taken over everything, all is lost. I mean, that's easy to do. Everybody can put their head in the sand and forget about it. Then we'll lose all the ash. That's guaranteed. Okay. Um, so just to look at the map, December 2012. Uh, it's like the thing to do is, you know, look at Ohio. You see Ohio. Well, it's fully engaged, right? No way. There's only a little bit of Ohio that's really infested. These are all the infestations in Ohio. I mean, that's as of February 2012. It's obviously spread since that point in time. But I'm just trying to make my point that now is the time to do something rather than to sit around and, 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 and you know, blah, blah, blah about it. Um, so this is New York State. And as I mentioned, this is the old quarantine, which is actually still in place. The new quarantine won't be in place until May, OK? sure everybody knows that. That little thing on YNN, that was wrong. Right. It's not in place yet. Um, unfortunately, there's no time to comment on it, uh, because it's being done as a quote-unquote emergency order. Uh, I'll have more to say about that. I'm not holding any. I'm not going to hold back. So here we have in New York State, you know, we have the biggest infestations, definitely the biggest ones, Ulster, but Monroe, Erie County, you know, it's probably been here for well over 10 years, if, you know, if not 15 years. 
That's why it's built up to the point that it is. Um, these are building very quickly because we have more ash in those areas. These, these Genesee County, we've got bug in a trap. For three years, we've searched like the Dickens, have yet to find any infested trees. The same is down here in Tioga County. Just this last year, Sally and I have been down there a couple of times looking. We have yet to find any infested trees. So the big ones, Erie, Monroe, Ulster. I mean, how much of the state is infested? Not very much right now. Um, the economic impacts, something to pay attention to. There is a paper that's really looked at this. The economic impacts, some of my friends got together with some economists and, and did this thing. The most important points, I've been over them before, but I think it's really important everybody to hear it. We found that the costs are largely borne by homeowners and municipal governments. Uh, wood and foam boring insects are anticipated to cause the largest economic impacts by annually inducing nearly $1.7 billion. Annually, $1.7 billion of expenditure uh, and approximately $830 million in lost residential property values. Really, the worst thing is the next observation. Given the observations of new species, these guys aren't dumb, by the way. I mean, they're really smart people. There's a 32% chance that another highly destructive forest species will invade the U.S. in the next 10 years. Isn't that, isn't that a nice thought? Um, if you're looking just at the emerald ash borer, they use they use it as a, a poster child. Um, the uh, uh, expenditures, I know it's hard to see the numbers back there, but basically, federal government expenditures are 2.3%. Uh, forest landowner timber loss. 3.6%. It's probably higher in New York State because I think ash, we have more ash than anybody else, and uh, timber is a more important revenue source in the state. So, I mean, 3.6 is still not very much, but when you look at it, the local government expenditures, 50.7%. Household expenditures, 20.9%. That's the how, that's the trees in people's backyards. And then residential property value loss, 22.6%. I mean, those are huge numbers. The biggest, obviously, there's no question about the largest economic impact is on homeowners and local governments. Back to the big, huge quarantine proposed for May by New York State Department of Ag and Markets, not DEC. Ag and Markets proposed this. It's an emergency order. There will be no comment on this when it's imposed, okay? So we have how much of our forests infested? Maybe 2%. In disparate areas, what about all those areas in between? Do people live in those areas? Who will be impacted greater? Timber industry, in timber industry or local governments? Local governments and individuals. So, it makes most sense to me that we try and slow down the spread so that local governments have time to plan. You guys don't have much time to plan anymore. Other places do. We want to slow the spread. But instead, Ag and Markets opens it up, and they say in their press release, to enhance commerce in timber species. And the thing to pay attention to is that, I'm obviously really pissed about this, it does not restrict movement of saw timber anywhere within the quarantine <coughs> during the flight season. So you can have infested saw timber on your truck, you can drag it down the freeway, and those beetles can be emerging off the logs as you go, just like fleas off a dying dog. Does this I make me your angst, Mark? The Does this make me happy? And communities uh, yeah, get, the, get the, the, the opposite feeling that they're somehow safe because it's a quarantine area. Yeah. Have you That's, isn't that silly? <laughs> yeah, I know. And, so, and you know, it's like, and, and I don't know where that attitude comes from, but Ag and Mark would love to hear that. They're getting the exact opposite from me and from Melissa. No, no, I know. I know. And, and I think it's really important because the really sad thing is that the attitude I get more often when it comes to a quarantine, even when they did half the damn West State, was that people said, oh, well, it's all quarantine. So why bother? It's everywhere. And that is, should not be more counterproductive. Nothing could be more counterproductive than that <coughs> attitude. And that's what this is going to do. You can write your local representatives about this stupid rule being put forward by the U.S. Department of Ag or the New York State Department of Ag and Markets. I think it would be really important for them to hear from everybody because, let me tell you, they've heard a hell of a lot from the timber industry. That's why this is in place. Okay, I'm not going to say anything more because I'm liable to get into a lot of trouble because I can't. Hey, Mark. Um, so one possibility is also for the task force to write a letter. 
So that's, I don't know if the task force might be willing to do that. That's a good uh, but idea. The, in the um, press release about the quarantine, they cite the task force as knowing that these are bodies that are legitimately helping municipalities do this. So one possibility is for task forces to lodge a complaint. Thanks, Sally. Please, go ahead. I didn't even tell you to say that. No. <laughs> I mean, I think you'll be heard. <laughs> I, I think it's important that, you know, that they don't get away with this kind of crap. Excuse me. And I really do think that word fits. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, just to think about it, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, it's like one of the, another one of the compelling, you know, impacts that we're going to have economically, think about the infrastructure surrounding power. You all know about that, right? From the local storms that we have, recent storms. Just think about the EAV. I mean, looking, doing numbers, you've probably have seen this before in previous presentations. I got it together with Brian Skinner, and we, we threw some numbers together. The total number of vulnerable miles of transmission lines, that's the lines that actually where a tree could fall on the lines, is 105,000, miles, okay? And over the, that period, over that area, National Grid estimates that there are about 242 trees per mile that could fall on the wires. Okay, that makes 26 million trees. Okay, what percentage of those trees are ash? Well, using a very conservative estimate of 20%, I think it's a lot more because ash likes to seed into disturbed habitat types and is a power line corridor a disturbed habitat? You bet. Okay, so very conservative estimate, 20%. That makes 5 million ash trees that have to be dealt with. Okay, and when you take a conservative estimate of tree removal, of $300 a tree, and y'all in the timber in the uh, industry know how much that costs. That's $1.5 billion that the ratepayers are going to have to pay, and I think that's a best case scenario. I mean, that means that if, all, if we ignore all this and we take, drag up crews from Georgia to help us work on it, we're going to be spending a lot more. So, anyway, that's enough of that crap. Uh, population behavior. The thing I want you to pay attention to there's two things, two things that, that, that keep uh, pests. Uh, that determine the way populations move. And that's what I'm going to um, focus on uh, from this point on. It's like, what are you dealing with here? And how can you think about what's going on so that you can plan ahead? Uh, pest pressure and host tree density are two things that do this. Pest pressure is very simple. It's the number of bugs at one, point, one place at one point in time. You get a lot of bugs in one place. You get a lot different population behavior than if you have just very few. Okay. Um, it determines how quickly a tree will be killed. It determines the rate of spread. Um, and it's a critical factor in management decisions. Pest detection is very difficult at the very lowest pest pressures. Very easy when it's very, they're very high. And the treatment options are limited, uh, depend on those. You don't have very many treatment options when you have high population. You do when you have a low population. Ash density determines the rate of population buildup. You have a lot of ash in one place. The populations are going to build up really quickly. If they have to go searching far and wide to find the next ash tree, uh, the populations aren't going to be building up very quickly, but they're going to be so foraging far and wide, so it's actually going to be spreading very quickly. And I think that's what happened here. You don't have a lot of ash in this area. What you see, you do have some, but they're, they're, they're dispersing pretty quickly. Um, so this is something to pay attention to, the death curve. Yeah, some Star Wars music. Um, so, this is what we feel is happening with emerald ash borers, uh, wherever they are. This actually was developed by Dan Hearns, uh, who, who was working in southern uh, Michigan from the get-go. And so, you know, basically, it, it plops along for a while, you know, very low densities for a long time. And I've actually seen trees that have been infested for seven years. They still have perfectly green canopy in them. And we found that out by looking it up, up in the crown of the tree, and we saw these vertical cracks. And we're thinking, oh, vertical cracks, that could be it. And so we chopped the thing down, and sure enough, we, we sliced through it, and I'll show you how we did that. We found it infested for seven years. So it takes a while for the populations to build up, but it's incredibly difficult to detect at these low levels. It gets into this part, and we begin detecting it, okay? And then once we detect it, say right in this point, this is, happens to be when it was first detected in the, um, in the Detroit area, 25, 30% of the trees were being, were being killed. They had just four years before they were all dead. That's the thing to keep in mind. Once you get to the point in time where you can actually detect it readily, the game's lost. 
You've got a lot of trees that are infested, probably beyond the point that you can bring them back with pesticide treatment, and you've got a big problem because you're going to have 100% mortality very quickly. Okay? That's, that's the operative thing with this book. And this is just so important. Keep this death curve in your mind. Okay? Four years until death. Here's another way of looking at it. This is uh, Cliff Sadoff and Deb McCullough uh, put their ideas together. And, and Deb has this category, the cusp, the crest, and the post-crest, not toothpaste. Aggressive management up to the point of where the populations collapse, then maintenance management after that. When you're thinking about managing for this thing, you've got to keep that death curve in your mind with aggressive management until most of the bugs are gone, and then you can do, get on a maintenance schedule afterwards. Uh, this 8% here is the level at which uh, Cliff thinks that uh, people now actually get it when it's in their community. 8% death. That's, that's when people begin to say, oh, wow, we do have a problem. And then after that 8%, you have one, two, three, four years until total death. That's not much time. And that's the biggest problem. You've got to catch, catch it before. And that's why that red area on that map is so important. Okay? That red area is where people should be actually focusing their efforts on any control activity. Um, so here's tier one, tier two, tier three. Again, the death curve. Uh, tier one populations are just building. Tier two, you know, they're they're just just beginning to go on the inflection. You're right here in tier three, where they're just absolutely lunacy uh, around Ruby, Ruby right now. So again, populations for tier three are moving. They're high and they're moving rapidly. And but the exploratory insects are out here. The thing about dermal dash borer is that they're it's a very successful. Uh, technique they have in a population. There are certain individuals that are just hell-bent on dispersal. They just take off and they go. They just don't, you know, what most of them probably do is they come out of the tree, and I'm, I don't mean to anthropomorphize, but, you know, you've got to use it sometime, and they look around and say, oh, okay, so where's the nearest tree? I'm going to feed on a few leaves to fatten up my ovaries, then I'm going to go and, and lay the tree on, find the nearest tree that's uninfested. And usually they steer close by. There's some that come out and they just go, I'm out of here. Boom. And they're gone. And that's, that's where we have the, the tail out here. That's why the red and the yellow zones on that map are so important to pay attention to. They are there. The populations are building. They're at the very low end of the death curve, but they're there. But the populations, you see most of them are on tier one. The populations are very close to the distance where you figure it, that it's emerged. Right near here, we're tier three population with Ulster County. Most, a lot of the population has actually gone from Ruby. Most of the population is out. It's on the Zena Road. It's, it's out elsewhere. And it's just it's sort of like moving like a wave. But you've got these outliers causing those satellite infestations to take off. Uh, so here's the current populations. Here we have Tier 3, Tier 3. This is vert on the edge of Tier 3, probably Tier 2 still. Tier, tier 1, Tier 1, Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 2, Tier 2. So we don't have a lot. Most of the forests in New York are not infested, but we have a lot to work with. Notice all of this area in here is uninfested. And let me tell you, there's been a heck of a lot of work that's gone into detection. All of this is now in the quarantine, and it's uninfested. Looking at ash density, here you are, 5%. This is from the FIA data, the same data that we used for the map. 5% total basal area in Ulster County. Uh, not as much ash. They're spreading, though. They're spreading rapidly. Get up here, Monroe County, 26% Niagara County, 28% Orleans County, 15% in, in Erie County. We've got a, a very different problem out there because they're not going to be moving as rapidly, but boy, when those populations build up, they are going to be just like a big, huge behemoth, okay? Uh, so this is just, boy, that turned out really fuzzy. TV really makes a difference. You have to fix that. So this is when we first found it a couple of years ago. You know, that was up here in this campground. There were two bugs in a trap. Then we started to look around. We determined that this was the original black area, about 80 square miles, maybe a little bit more. Okay? Notice where the red is. Notice where the yellow is. Okay? So this is the current one. <laughs> all the way out to here. What, two years later? You're finding woodpecks all the way out to here. And that was the edge of the yellow zone two years ago. 
So these things, that's why this yellow and red are important. And, you know, I'm going to argue that I think that this yellow zone should be expanded, considering the, the population size you have here. Although there's not as much ash in this county, um, I, when it gets to be this point in Monroe County or Erie County, this is not going to be five miles. This is going to be ten miles in my book. Uh, just because the, the density of bugs is just going to be so much higher because there's so much more ash. So, figure the population started, as far as, as far as we can tell, in the Ruby area. And you can see it's been, been going rapidly away from there. You know, these are just individual trees. We drove here through here this morning, and I really couldn't see much going on. So, you know, it's like, yes, the black zone is way out here, but this is probably at the very, you know, maybe it just as the death curve goes up, okay? The death curve in this area, around Woodstock, you're right there in the middle of that death curve. I mean, in a couple of years, all the trees are going to be dead. No question about it. They are already are all infested. I would, be, I would be happy to bet on that. I don't bet. Yes. I hate to break your rhythm, but how long would it take to study what it is that makes the guys who come out of the tree really travel? And what makes them unique? Yeah, because we it makes only... sense to pay attention to them and try and coax them from doing that. Yeah. Is that years of study? I would like to chop their little elytra off. Um, <laughs> you know, there's pheromones in the right? No, there's, there's no pheromones with this insect as far as we know. Really? Which is interesting. Otherwise, those purple traps would be really effective. <laughs> That's why they're not effective because we have nothing that we know that really attracts them, that wants them to go to that trap. And right now it's just color and, and, a, and a sachet of, of uh, host tree volatiles that we feel are more important, uh, most important. So it is not very effective. You know, the problem with insects is that we try and study dispersal, but you know, and it's like the cutting edge right now in, in insect dispersal is actually uh, car, uh, you know, radio labeling them with radioactive things, and then going and trapping them, and seeing, you know, put your traps up and you catch them, and if you put them through a scanner and you see it's been radio labeled, then you know where it came from. Um, something like this, where you maybe get 1% of the population that's held bent on dispersal, so you radio label 100 of them. Only one of them is going to take away off. And then you have all these traps set out. What's your chances of catching it? It's really low. Um, I think there's far more important things to, to study right now. But it's, you know, it's definitely on our minds. You know, what is it that triggers that dispersal? Um, so, you know, it's like on the death curve right now, it's at the cusp, it's at the very top in this area right here, and gradually it goes down. Woodstock is probably right in the inflection point of the death curve, and it's right at the tail end in these areas down here, okay, and up here in Casco, although I like to look at that population up there that you just got going. There's a heck of a lot of ash down here in the cementin area. I imagine the populations have been building up really quickly. And so, you know, it's like, it all depends. It's not like, okay, it's, it isn't a short and sweet story that it all started right here, and therefore it's radiating out in nice little equal lines. No, because there's pockets of ash, density modifies population buildup. So you get pockets of ash like around cementin, the populations just go through the ceiling because there's a lot of ash. The Zena Road is another example. Lots of ash around Zena Road. Populations go up. And so you see, like, it's, it, it's sort of like, probably looked like a globular. If you really had an idea of the distribution, it would probably be a, a globular thing spreading out from these areas from these big pockets of ash rather than this nice, neat line. But this is all we have. This is the best we have. And this is really good because if you think about it, the red and the yellow mixed in there, I think you have a good idea of the places where we should be working and how to operate in them. Okay? Uh, AB detection, I've gone through this you know, detection 101 so many times. But off, you know, the most important thing to remember is that so many times people call up and they just have one tree in their yard that's infested. They have ash all over their yard, but just one tree that you know looks dead. And so they call me up and I said, listen, any other ash have any symptoms? No. I said, that's not on the ash board, because all of them would be to have symptoms. By the time your tree begins to show symptoms, that thing is spread to everything around it, and they should all be showing the same symptoms. Use multiple symptoms in the diagnosis. Woodpeckers are our friends. So, you know, the, the, the signs and symptoms that we use, bark splitting, remember it's the, it's the hail, holy grail, if you can find that, you're, you're walking on water. Woodpecker foraging is it. Woodpecker foraging, tier one, we see woodpecker foraging just like one here, one there, one there. 
before any other signs or symptoms show up besides bark splitting. Tier 2 populations of building, woodpecker foraging is much more apparent. Canopy thinning begins to show up. Remember, that's the one everybody harps on is canopy thinning. By the time you get canopy thinning in your stand, those trees are toast. Absolute toast. You should be looking a mile, two miles away. Okay, epicormic sprouting. Again, tier 3 in the middle around Ruby right now. Canopy thinning, boy, you can see those thin canopies everywhere. Woodpecker foraging is just, just totally taking all the bark off the tree. Epicormic sprouting. This is the bark splitting you can see inside here. There's the little, you can see the galleries. Um, basically, the, the bladel gets in, but the first it kills the bark size of your hand. The phloem all around it is perfectly healthy, so the next year it grows. The bark cracks a little bit more when it grows, and it cracks a little bit more when it grows. Um, this is a good example of it here. Here you can see the gallery right there. Um, and this was the original wound. You see it's discolored from here to here. The original wound came out there. Then the tree grew over it. This is actually a five, this was five years old. That, and if you look at it carefully, it still has perfectly healthy foam all around it. Um, this is, I, peel, I peeled the bark off so you could see it. Here you see the gallery again. So that's, that's the holy grail. And this is what happens, you know, at the very beginning of the death curve, where you get trees, you know, just a few bugs around, and it's just impossible. Ten, ten, five, ten minutes. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll hurry up. Okay, and this is it again. Uh, this tree, I'll show you again. There's simply another you know, thing while well, all the foam is dead in there, but it still has green leaves. That's this tree right here. <laughs> still has green leaves. Um, canopy thinning, epicarmic sprouting is good, especially if there's no woodpeckers around. There's the woodpecks. The thing about woodpecks, you see here's where it, it's gotten old. It's gotten a little bit oxidized. These are pretty fresh pecks here. They actually reach in, grab out a larvae. That's what you want to look for is where they reach in. Here's one. This is down by Ruby recently. These are pupil cases that are actually in the bark itself, not in the wood. So they're going to do those. The thing that you're seeing around here is this, right? Just incredible, incredible bark peeled off. That tells me that there are a lot of bugs that are the exact same size in one place. That is a heavy duty population. You're, a, you're, a, you're dealing with a tier three population that is at the height of its existence because they just came in and they're swarmed. This tree probably died in one year. Just, they just laid a million eggs on it and they're all the same stage. Louis Pepper tells me that they were the same age and they just took it out. Here's where we get lower population levels, you'll see sort of the finicky eaters, right? It's just sort of peppered all around. This is what you're seeing around here right now, just whole areas, just in massive amounts. You see this? There's not as many bugs in that tree. Same thing here. This is blonding from a distance. Interestingly enough, this tree was infested on that side, but not <coughs> on that side. The bugs, the EAB, was not in this side. The woodpeckers knew that. You know why? Because this side is facing west, where it got nice and warm. EAB produce, pr prefers the warm areas of the tree. Again, looking at it, the salt and pepper of lower populations. This is the native ash borer, the red-headed ash borer. It goes for weakened tissue. It doesn't you know, go all over the tree. It focuses its efforts where the tissue is weaker. It can detect that. It goes deeper into the woods. It's a different family, a serumbicid. You can see the foraging. You see it, the woodpeckers are going much deeper into the tree, and they're going all in one line. Oftentimes what happens is you get a, a damaged point on the tree. Maybe somebody backed into it with their car or whatever. So the tissue distal to that is weakened, and it'll go after that. And it'll go after just that weakened tissue right there. You also see there's a problem because there's fungi right there. There's some conks coming out of it. So population control, populations are kept under control by host tree resistance and biological control. We don't have either. We need to have biological control if we ever expect to get ash back on the landscape again. And so we need to work on it immediately. And so these are the bugs we're working on. There's an egg parasitoid. And there's two larval parasitoids that are being worked with right now. Hopefully, we'll get another one um, in two families. These are Braconids spathius and Braconids detrasticus. It's a chalcid. Boobius is also a chalcid. Two different families of wasps, stingless wasps. Um, Obvious is good because it goes for the egg, okay? Eggs are laid on the outside. They're all apparent. It's really good to get that one going. The problem with the larval parasitoids is they have to outward cause it through the bark. They're tiny, right? And so they're limited access 
to the larvae is limited. Where you get thin bark up at the top of the tree, there'll be much more access, and we get higher levels of parasitism. When you get down lower in the tree where you got really thick bark, you're not going to get there. You're not going to get them. So, I think it's really important that you all realize that we need these bugs here, and they need to ha this needs to happen now, and it needs to happen as fast as possible in order to retain ash in our environment. The thing to remember is that they're not going to take the population down. They're not going to control the emerald ash borer. Don't expect that. That's the problem, is the politicians now expect that. They say, hey, you've had 10 years of funding, you've been releasing these bugs, so what's, where's, the, where's the beef? And it's not going to work that way. And it's like, as soon as we realize that, the sooner we realize that, but we realize that it's a long-term thing, it's not a short-term thing. If we want, you know, it's like when the ash come back, they're going to have nice, smooth bark, right? You're going to get nice, high levels of, of, of parasitism when those nice, young ash come up out of the ground, okay? That's when it's going to be a really important thing to control the insect. Um, there are also native insects involved. You know, the efforts, I don't know, the problem with this is that everybody wants parasitoids now. Last year we had Ag and Marcus was working on it, and you know, it's like they, they set aside people to work on it, and we had a number of different sites around the state selected for biological control agents released. We didn't get enough to, but look, to look at the sites that we'd already released at. One of them, luckily, is here. But you know how fast this thing is moving across the landscape, right? There just aren't enough bugs to go around. Um, it's a sad thing, but we have to get on it. There are native parasitoids. I found uh, Spathius floridanus, a native Braconid parasitoid, uh, up in the Monroe area. Uh, very few of them, but they were on emerald ash borer. And I also found some Eno claris. But the thing to think about with biological controls is that it's an additive thing. You get this wasp killing so many, you get that wasp killing so many, you get that predator eating so many, you get woodpeckers killing so many, and boom, 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 pretty soon you get a pretty high level of control. So that's what we want to do. We want to keep adding these characters in there, keep adding them in so the control gets to a level where they're not taking out the trees, they're not being as aggressive. Um, so we don't have much time. What do we do now? You better know, sure as heck, know where your ash are. If you don't know where your ash are, you're, you're out of luck. Um, and explore management options. I'm going to go through something called the EAB cost calculator from Purdue University. I recommend anybody that's responsible for managing ash trees on your, in your municipality or anywhere, you get on that program and you play around with it because it's going to give you some valuable information. Okay, it's eabindiana.info is the website. Um, and know where it is. We already talked about that. It's so important okay, to get that eabindiana.info. Management options, going through it, do nothing. That's really helpful. Viability issues will hit you really fast. Remove all the ash trees before they become infested. Well, that's expensive, um, but you, you, and you lose a lot of canopy. Removal of ash as they become infested, that's an expensive reactive management because all of a sudden, you remember, remember the death curve? All of a sudden, you have a lot of ash dead all at once. Do you have the crews around to deal with that? Ooh, and we don't Mythica. Then the other option is to treat with insecticides to retain canopy, and it gives you more options dealing with stuff. Pesticide use strategies, basically, a lot of communities now are using insecticides to spread out tree removals according to the schedule that you've developed within your community, rather than the schedule dictated to you by the emerald ash borer, meaning the death curve, okay? That four, four, four years you have in the death curve can be spread out over a much longer period of time, so you can actually handle it in a much more logical manner. Um, you've got to plan for treatments at least 12 years out. That's the thumbs rule from, from uh, the Midwest. The emerald ash borer stays in an area for 12 years, perhaps more. But you've got to plan for at least 12 years. Um, and the best thing to do is to start early in the infestation cycle. And it's easy to understand why. Because the fewer attacks you have in the tree, the better the tree is able to take up the pesticide and spread it around evenly throughout the crown. You have a big tree that's had problems over the years. You might not get it into one big branch that's leaning over the sidewalk that the kids take to walk to grade school every day. That tree, that branch dies. You've got a bigger problem than you started with. Uh, you know, you got to be, you got to determine which trees you really are going to keep. Young trees respond best to the uptake of the pesticide, and they're the ones that are going to be most able to retain the character of that tree at that point in time. 
Um, and you've got to plan to aggressively protect them for 12 years or more. Um, so the basics, a stream, spring application is, is really, without question, the best. You can apply at other times of the year, but you know, the things that I'm going to cover, the strategies I'm going to cover, they demand spring treatment. Okay? And that's basically so that the insecticide not only will kill, get into the tree and kill the larvae developing in the phloem tissue, but it'll also kill the adults feeding on the leaves. It gets up into the, up into the crown of the tree. All it takes is one bite of a, of a pesticide-treated leaf, and the things are dead. Um, timing is important because you, the EAB adults come out end of May. You've got to be sure and get the insecticide up into the tree quickly. Okay. Um, Three basic applications, soil drench or injection. I don't, I don't encourage anyone to do that because my aunt taught me about pest control when I was really young and her theory was a little bit works, a lot of work a lot better. And I don't like the pesticide loading aspect of the environment. Um, but the only homeowner product is a soil drench and it's imidacloprid. The imidacloprid is not as effective at high population pressure, and not as effective as amomectin benzoate. Bark spray, the dinotefuran, you were mentioning that, it's a lot faster to use the dinotefuran product, but it is actually, actually just a one year, it's a rapid application and uptake. It has a lot of advantages uh, over the injection, which is both the imidacloprid and the amacrin benzoate products. Uh, trunk injection can be time consuming, but it has very limited environmental exposure. I like that aspect of it, as opposed to the soil drenches. Um, the different products, imidacloprid, Merit and Zytec uh, primarily, it must be used annually. There's no question about it. You have to apply annually. Uh, spring and fall applications, but once again, spring is the time to do it. If you're doing a fall application, you absolutely need the two times formulation. Um, and if you get very high press pressure, like in the middle around Ruby or whatever right now, you've got to use the two times uh, formulation in springtime. Uh, otherwise, the one time formulation is not as very effective uh, at the high press pressure. And a tefuran, it must be used annually, spring only, rapid, it's a very rapid uptake. It's very good with hemlock woolly adelgid also. You get a big, huge tree. You can do, we also have, we have an SLN for hemlock woolly adelgid. I bought that two years ago, and we just got the SLN for, for ash borer just this year. So those are the two things you can use it on. It's only the basal bark spray, which is going to spray the tree up to about here. Um, but a very good product because it's very rapid. Emectin benzoate is the gold standard incredible effectiveness of the pesticide. One application will remain effective for three seasons. The label says two. Data from Deb McCullough says three. She hasn't published it yet. I actually just wrote her an email just to be sure. She said, no, I haven't published it, but yes, three years is what I have. Four years, it starts to fall down. So you can be nice to your customers and say, I'm not going to treat it, but only every fourth year. And you'll be, you're going to make them smile, and you're going to be just as effective. Okay. Spring and fall application, but once again, spring application is the one to shoot for. It is definitely, at high pest pressure, the only thing that is really effective. There's a nice booklet. It's on our website, nyis.info. Lots of stuff on our website. Um, there's the cost calculator. from the AB Indiana. Cliff Sadoff did that. He said, it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, I asked him about his kids, and he said, no. I'm going to ask for cost calculator. Um, but it's really easy to work with. And I, I put this in, you know, just, just goofing off with it. You can, you can modify it. There are some demos in there that you can automatically log into. You can play around with them. But if you want to start putting in data pertinent to your situation, you can start entering in, you know, number of trees within different size span, tree size class distribution. You can look at the number of years that you've been infested, four years, 8% damage to death. Um, so, and then you can look at the cost for treatment, so you can modify the, the treatment, the application treatments. You can modify the replacement costs. You can look at the initial tree mortality rate uh, and tree replacement mortality rate, which is usually around 2%. Um, and you can look at removal costs. That will vary according to size or whatever. And then you can start playing around with it. And this is just the demo right here. Um, and so the different options are, option one is replace all unsafe ash. Option two is replace all ash immediately. Uh, and option three is save 50% of the ash trees in your community. Um, and these are all the assumptions right here. I don't have much time, so I'm not going to go over it. But suffice it to say, they're pretty good assumptions. This is the thing to pay attention to. Black is replace unsafe ash. So we have black right here. Just replace the trees as they die. OK? 
Okay, remember the death curve? You get those trees accumulating four years, your expenditures go up to 282,000. This is in a, a, a community of 1,200 ash trees, okay? It just jumps, it spikes, and then it drops down, and then you're done. You've spent all your money, but boy, that's a one heck of a hit over a few years for a community. If you're going to replace all your ash trees over a six-year period of time, there you are, you're spending $121,000 over a six-year period, then boom, you're done. It's all, you're all done with your ash, okay? But if you want to save 50% of your trees, the, the, press, the, the price goes up here, but then it dwindles as you're in your maintenance, and so the cost, goes to, the cost is actually much lower. If you go over a 25-year period of time, the costs for treatment do add up and come to the original thing, but that's spread out over 25 years, as opposed to being over a four-year period of time or a six-year period of time. And the most important thing is that you have retained your canopy. Canopy is very important. Uh, there are a number of different you know, things. Everybody knows how valuable their trees are, right? Uh, there's two different valuation methods. You know, the landscaping, energy savings, water interception, business activity is an important one, and human health. Uh, the human health thing, I just, I'm going to throw this up here. A really great study looking at Emerald Ash Borer in the Midwest. They found that um, the results suggest that loss of trees to the Emerald Ash Borer increased mortality related to cardiovascular and lower, res lower respiratory tract illness. This finding adds to the growing evidence that the natural environment provides major public health benefits. I can get this paper to anybody if you want it. It's just it's a very compelling. There are very few really rock solid examples of why trees are important in an urban environment. But if you look at the benefits, retaining the tree canopy, look at your, your tree canopy drops down to just the very low levels with both with the first two, uh, with the replace unsafe ash and replace all the trees, and then gradually increases. That, that assumes that you replace the trees when you take them out. Okay, with the treatment, your canopy is well above 100% at year 10. It's at 100%. You've retained much of your urban tree canopy already. Uh, and this is another study done by Rick, Rick Hoover, Rick Howard, uh, at Stevens Point. I'm waiting for this one to get up online. The thing that he's looked at that is really important in his model is that the benefit-cost ratio is something to pay attention to. And if you look at the treatment of trees, I forget exactly his assumptions in this model, but basically the treatment of trees, if you consider the benefit of retaining the tree canopy, um, it's for every dollar invested, you get back $1.37. That's, that's a significant thing. Whereas if you remove and replant, for every dollar you invest, you get back only $0.37. Cents. So you're losing. 70 or 60 cents on every dollar when you go the remove and replant, or the preemptive removal is 50 cents on the dollar. So the cost-benefit ratios for these different treatment uh, is, is, is significant. Um, the thing I want to talk about now is a concept brought up by Deb McCullough at MSU, Michigan State, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. It's what they call urban slam or slow ash mortality. And basically the concept is this, okay? You treat a certain number of trees in an area over time. And the adult beetles, when they come up, what are the chances of actually feeding on a treated tree? And so the adult beetle comes up. If you treat 10% of your trees, it's like one in 10 tree will be treated. And so the chances of the beetle feeding on a treated tree are one in 10. Maybe over its lifetime, it finally will, but there's some that will escape. If you get up to 20% of the trees, it's one-fifth of the trees are treated. And so the chances are even greater. And if you use amibect and benzoate, so it's out there for two years or three years, so effectively after three years, 40% of the trees are, in fact, are, are treated. And, and the chances of a bug feeding on the foliage of the treated tree are very high. And so it will actually control the beetles in an area by that adult feeding. It definitely reduces significantly the open position. So here you look at it. This is Deb, Deb and uh, Rodrigo Mercado did this study in 2002. It's just it's an excellent model. Um, confusing as all hell, but it's a great model. Um, and they did put a lot of data into it. So with no treatment, you get the death curve. Boom, done. Ten years, everything's gone. Forget it. Uh, with 10% treatment in their model, you wound up with maybe you know 75% of the tree canopy. With only 20% treatment. You, get, you retain 99% of the canopy. This is a model. 
but it says a lot. There's a lot of data that's gone into that model, and I think it's really cool. If you look at it, these are the annual treatment costs. Remember the death curve here, you're at the, this is the death curve, height of the death curve. Here are your costs, your costs for removing moving trees. These are the costs for treating. If you treat here, it's year zero. Your cost here, 50% of the trees treated are there. 40% is just below it. 30% is just below that. Where's 20%? 20% is right here, even lower. And 10%, it actually goes up because there's more depth. Um, there's the importance of detecting it early. At year four, the 10% becomes really an ineffective treatment. But the 20% is also very effective. So they figure that 20% of the trees treated every year at random will retain 99% of the tree canopy in that area. I think that's a pretty cool thing. She's working on it right now. They're trying it out in the real world. And I'd love to find some places to try that out here. Because, you know, it's like we've been thinking, oh, if you have a lot of trees out there, it's forget it. You know, you're going to lose them all. Don't even bother trying to treat them. And everyone knows that now we're not so it ain't the cheapest stuff in the world. I've got to wrap this up. Okay. Um, but if you look at it in Cliff's thing as well, the urban slam, when you implement it, the 20% treatment, look at the cost related to the others. It's just way, way, way lower than the others. Definitely. And, and here you get, you don't even get a dip to the loss of trees with 50, losing 50%. You get increased canopy coverage over time. So, <laughs> I still, I actually, I did this talk last week, and somebody said, but Mark, what happened to your cartoon? So, okay, that's, that's all I wanted to say, because you're about to kick me out of here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
have a, some sort of a meeting of the task force. Definitely. In one future date. Uh, um, other, uh, I just, since I printed them out, I might as well, this was from Mary Kramarczyk. This is Jeff, this is the one page, like, for the urban forestry grant. Um, take one if you want, but it's just sort of a one pager. It's the grant rounds are coming. I wish George was here. Um, yeah, you know more. Uh, sorry. The spring? I think it's like, yeah, no, the not the spring. Is that the yeah. spring when they come out again? Yeah, I think the last ones were awarded in June last year. Okay. So the um, RFP will probably come out. Mary Shoots. There were some changes, some tweaks to the program this year to make it almost like inviting more EAB related applications, is the sense that I got. So I don't know if that's um, something for all the municipalities. I mentioned game of logging on here. I know Maryland's very familiar with it. That was something we talked about at the last um, task force meeting was safety uh, issues and related to that. So um, I don't know, Maryland, if you have any um, game of logging scheduled. I did look at the if folks that are interested. Um, the Casco Forest Association has three coming up. Um, one on and I can circulate these dates, I'll include it in a minute. It's 5, May 25th, June 29th, and October 12th are three um, game of logins that take place in, in Arkville. There's a cost associated with those. Yeah. Are you, are you yeah, I mean, I don't coordinate those. I do it in other parts of the Catskills, but what you need to remember is that there's a, a maximum number of 10 people. And so if, and i not actually related to Emerald Ashford, but we had a number of our highway people take this five or six or seven years ago, and they just, you know, contacted Bill directly and said, we want to do this. It, it, it's just a, a phenomenal training. If, if you're dealing, well, you arborists who have a lot of these skills, but you know, it's just a, a really good skill, you know, for people to have if they're felling trees and, and want to have that expertise. And if people want the information, I can forward you. And Marilyn and I have been talking with Molly, and maybe there's a way to, to work out one for coordinator training. I mean, does anybody think in their community they feel they're, and I think we were targeting, you know, highway people in particular. Is there anybody who thinks their community might be interested in that? They're interested, but they need it. I watch my highway crews at work, and I'm scared. <laughs> really, yeah, I know, really and, and you know, Ash in particular. Well, you know, if you have, in, if you have an interest, Contact Molly and she'll get in touch with me and we'll see what we can do. We probably need just testimonials by people that have taken the course. People like you and I, I think, right? Uh, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. I grew up with a chainsaw oh, in my hand and, and I took that course and I was just, I was amazed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I deal with loggers who've been doing logging for a long time. Like, oh, I'm not going to learn anything. And they're like, oh my gosh. I did professional logging for years. Yeah. Clearly, yeah. yeah. saved my car. It didn't. <laughs> you want to have any control over your trees coming down, you should probably think this um, Well, I mean, if any, any other uh, things that we'll we We probably should be giving out just generic safety information anyway about chainsaws and tree cutting and you know, yeah. those kinds of things. Because homeowners are going to do it, you know. Does Pete have anything drawn up for you that he's doing? He has, I think, a couple of trainings, but. No, no, I mean, he's he's written. Written. Written that we could out. Yeah, there is something. It was really hard because um, the whole game of locking, the philosophy is you don't hand out anything written because you do it enough times so that you have to remember it. And if you hand somebody something, they're like, all right, I can look at it after when I leave. But I, I do have some, um, some things that... I've gotten, you know, <laughs> to remind people, Meryl, do you have anything? I can't remember what, you know, what the width is and the ratio. And I'm like, okay, here's a cheat sheet, but. I mean, just the basic stuff, like wearing chaps and helmets and things like that. You know? Yeah, and maybe that could be part of our education and outreach. And power lines. lines. Yeah. Power lines. I don't know. See, I think our, our insurance agent would be very upset with me if I started saying things like that. He would not like that. All right, well, this has been a, a 
a wonderful meeting with so much to talk about. We could go on for another hour for certain. Uh, maybe we should. Hey, can I make a suggestion just from watching the other task forces around the state? There's a lot to do. And I think at the end of every meeting like this, we feel like, oh, we just talked about so much, but there's so much more to do. And I think one of the ways they found that helps is organizing like committees, like subcommittees within the task force, so that a couple people can get together and make a safety sheet for chainsaw safety. And a couple people can get together and send a letter to all the municipalities for you know offering education. So that could be one way. Yeah, no, that's a wonderful suggestion. I was going to suggest maybe we meet a little bit more regularly as well, as just because it is so, so uh, the need is so great, right? Because the season. <laughs> so, um, all right. Is everybody okay? Made it? See you all. All right, thank you all very, very much. And, um, well, if we were going to stay with the normal, it would be uh, April, May. Um, in the middle of June, but I think we're going to need to do something before that. So I'm open for suggestions. Maybe, maybe now's not the time for those. But um, now. okay, <laughs> yes, now is the time. All right. Yeah, do it. What, do you, what do you all think? Monthly? Every every other month? Um, at least every six weeks, I think. No, at this point, can't do three months. Now, I've been having three months. Yeah, what's wrong with monthly? Well, Karen, if you it shouldn't be it. this long. <laughs> 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 you guys can meet. I'll sit it out now. Um, oh, good. I don't know. Um, we'll see for... You want to do a month? I think we can do... We can always revise the plan also next month if you realize, wow, we've got so much accomplished. All right. Let's do, yeah, I, I think there's going to be, Jeff, I mean, how much new information do you expect in the next month from DEC? Is there, is there going to be another new slug of surveys or? We're in the process of figuring out exactly what to do with the management for the remaining federal funds we have. That discussion needs to be had at the central office level of the Forest Service uh, down here. I don't think we're going to have much more information. We're trying to figure out where the best place to establish the little trap trees for sinks. So there's a number of, so Molly mentioned some things in April. There's some training. I know Marilyn, you got something going. We got this thing Thursday. Some other workshops here over the next month or so. Maybe after those and sort of get back together and get. Maybe. Maybe we get back from every three months to every two months, and then we still feel okay. overloaded. Consider every month. So but let's shoot for early May. May. Well, this might be a time, though, to have a sooner month because mm -hmm. you know, there's just so much that's going to be happening uh, oh, this okay. season. I think I think you need to be prepared for you know municipal inquiries and whatever, and I don't think you're ready for it right now. Yeah. We've also got a week in April, Thursday, and Arbor Day, both of which are great. Please to meet before that. So you can that's a good point. Reaching out that we that's the week's chore So what week would that be then? Because before that? Weekend the week of the fifth is the week before Earth Day. Earth Day is twenty second of April. Right. So